And this marker is no good. I just put this new one in here. Alright, so today our goal is to learn how to get good uh, whiteboard markers. I have some. Yeah, you want them? I have some right with me. Oh, bring them out. We'll be very happy. What color do you want? I have green, right. blue, black. red, and black. Uh, black is my personal favorite. You know, honestly, you start no, you start using these things, and once you go once you go black, you don't know. So <laughs> I used red and green today to, to much effect. I don't like using red actually. You don't uh, only on only when people do their homework on the whiteboard do I use red. Say, how do I grade homework? You know, the red pen. Right. Okay, so if you do your homework on the whiteboard, I use a red marker. So. Um. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh boy. Long semester. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about the polar form of a complex number. Is this which, a cute cuddly bear form? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> no, those. those. No house with also an exposure form? <laughs> uh, not that I know. Uh, so, if you recall Math 166, for those who took it with me, we did something called polar coordinates. And I did that specifically so that you would have a better understanding of today's lecture. Thank you. All part of the master plan. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who didn't, at some point you saw a polar form because you did multi variable calculus, right? Mm -hmm. So you saw polar coordinates. Well, we'll have to review it a little bit. Uh, but it, it's very. Uh, all right, but let's quickly just kind of summarize what we know so far. So first, we have numbers that we call complex numbers. So that was a set of complex numbers. This meant z is an element of c. We use z for complex numbers instead of x. Uh, if it's a complex number, then it looks like z equals a plus bi, where i here is supposed to be some number that we don't normally have. But when you square it, it equals minus 1. And we assume that it commutes with a and b, thanks to, um, was it Christina, was it you? Mentioned that it needs to commute with a and b. It does. So, okay, and that's for all real numbers. OK, uh, something which we didn't write down, but we I said out loud quite a bit, is the following. Um, every complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. So I actually was going to. I'm going to write this down. Re of z is defined to be a, and im of z is defined to be b. Right? So this is the real part of a, and this is the imaginary part of, of a. Uh, real part of z and the imaginary part of z. So it actually gives you your first uh, well, your first function on the complex numbers. This, these are both functions from the complex numbers to the real numbers. Right. Notice that the imaginary part does not take into account the eye. It just looks at the, the real part of it. Okay. Uh, we have another uh, function that, that, actually, no, we, we did see a function from the complexes to the reals before. Uh, but before we get there, we had a function from the complexes to the complexes, which was the conjugate, right? the complex conjugate. And so the complex conjugate of z <coughs> is what you get by just changing the sign between the real and the imaginary parts. And this was uh, a handy device, for instance, to compute the uh, inverse of a complex number, 1 over z. All right. The way we're able to get it is by multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate. And the upshot of this was that if you took a number z and its conjugate z bar, when we multiplied them together, you actually got a real number a squared plus b squared. Right? a plus bi times a minus bi is actually a squared plus b squared. It looks a little wrong. It should be a squared minus b squared. But remember, there's this extra i term. And when you square i, it becomes a minus 1, and that flips the sign on you. Okay, uh, but we had another way of writing this, a squared plus b squared. Namely, it's what we call the norm of the complex number. 
And geometrically, the norm, well, if you draw the complex number in the complex plane, and you draw a vector, it's not supposed to curve, if you draw a vector out to this point, the norm is the length of this line segment. Isn't that supposed to be squared? Yeah, it should be squared. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the norm of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And this comes right from, if you like, the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. And then we saw something really nice, which was that if you take uh, a complex number z it's out there and you divide it by its norm, so this gives you some complex number which, well, from the geometric point of view, it's going in the same direction. The only difference is that it's shorter if you divide it by the norm. Look at this divided by the norm. And how short is it? Well, it's exactly length 1, right? which is why it's the norm. It normalizes the thing. Any, you take any complex number, divide by its norm, you get a new complex number in the same direction, but with length 1. So the magnitude is 1. Okay. Uh, note we also defined an addition on complex numbers and a multiplication on complex numbers. And it's done in exactly the way you'd want to do it. You have the real terms, you have the imaginary terms. When you multiply, you just FOIL. It's exactly the way you want to do it. And then we saw that this gave you a structure of a field on the set of complex numbers. So you basically can do all the arithmetic that you'd ever want to do in the complex numbers. All right, any questions on this before we move on? Do you want us to have questions? I, I always want you to have questions if you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant observation. Yeah, no, no, I mean, if you have a question, please ask. It's a, it's a good idea. All right. Well, with no questions, I want to push this picture a little bit further. This is where the polar coordinates are going to come. So let's do something which, uh, at least at the beginning, doesn't seem to have to do with trigonometry. Should I just spoil it? <laughs> doesn't have, seem to have to do with complex numbers, but with trigonometry. Okay. So, as those of you who've been with me before know, I don't think of trigonometry as a study of triangles, but as a study of circles, namely the study of the unit circle. So this is a nice circle, radius 1, centered at 0, comma 0. And if you draw a little line segment starting from the origin and heading out and hitting the circle, then this is going to make an angle with the x-axis, right? really with the positive x-axis. So that angle might be called theta. What are the coordinates of this point? X one. You can be more explicit than that. Cosine of x, comma sine of x. What's x? Oh, theta. Sorry. Right. This is coordinates are cosine of theta and sine of theta. So this was this was quite nice because, for instance, well, remember what's the equation of this circle? X squared plus y squared equals one. R R squared, right? But R here is 1, so it's 1. Okay, so every point on the circle has to satisfy this equation. In particular, cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. Right? Okay, so cool. That, that's the most important formula in trigonometry, right? So you know that for, for sure. And boom, there's an easy proof of it. Fine? Okay, so this is how you might define cosine and sine. Okay. So that's already quite nice. Uh, what you also get out of this is a new way of writing down the points in the plane. 
Right? So in the rectangular coordinates, or the Cartesian coordinate system, you look at the x-axis and the y-axis, and you say, okay, how far do I go over this way, and how far do I go up this way? Right? And that's, that's how you write down the coordinates. In the polar coordinate system, instead of asking, how far do I go over this way, and how far do I go up this way, you ask, from the origin, how far did I go away, and in what direction? Right? That is, what's the angle that I made between the x-axis and the line I would have to produce. Right? Of course, you don't have to stay on the unit circle. You can go anywhere you want to. You might go out here. Okay? So then you say, okay, fine. Connect it with a line. Okay, there's an angle, which maybe I'll call a psi, another nice Greek letter. And then I can ask how long this line is. Okay? And okay, maybe it's r. So then the coordinate of this point in polar coordinates is not 1.6 comma 4.8. Instead, it's well, r comma psi. Okay, you need two pieces of information. You need the distance or the radius, if you like, from the origin, and you need the angle that you produce with the x-axis. Good. Now, what's very nice about doing things like this is you, we're going to get some really easy ways of uh, geometrically seeing how to multiply and add complex numbers. That's going to be the, the first point we're trying to get at. So with this circle of radius 1, you get this as the coordinate. If we draw a circle of radius r, sort of, Theoretical circle. Theoretical circle. Okay. So this here, let me write a, um, a P so that we know we're talking the polar coordinate of this point, not the rectangular coordinate. Right? This here, let me write an R. That's the rectangular coordinate of that point. And by the way, what's the polar coordinate of this point? 1, comma, theta. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? It's a unit circle, so you've gone out 1. And what's the angle? Well, it's theta. So there's the, the polar coordinate. Okay. So what is the rectangular coordinate of this one? Would it just be cosine sine? Second? Wouldn't it just be cosine sine? Well, it can't be, because that's cosine, uh, I mean, cosine sine would be right there. Okay. This would be, this here is cosine oh, sine, right, 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 sine right, right. sine. Yeah. Right? That's the rectangular coordinate. Mm -hmm. And this would be 1 comma psi, that's the polar coordinate. So what is going to happen up here? Cosine psi over, over r. That sounds like a good guess. <laughs> Emphasis on guess. <laughs> no, it wasn't a guess. Oh, no? No. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Explain. Why is it over r? Because that's the definition of cosine and sine. Okay, so. Outside of the unit circle. All so. right, so let's, let's try to draw a straight line. My apologies, my apologies. I get in trouble like this at home. <laughs> okay, so let's see here. Uh, we have this angle psi. We have the hypotenuse of the triangle R, mm -hmm. and we're looking for the x coordinate and the y coordinate, right? Which is the x coordinate is actually the same as, as that point right there. Okay, so we just need to know how far we've gone over. Right? So if, if I call that x. How do I get x knowing the hypotenuse and the angle? So I, have the adjacent, I want to know the adjacent, and I have the hypotenuse and the angle. So cosine right already is a good idea, because cosine right is adjacent over hypotenuse. We'll see. So we know that cosine of psi should be the adjacent, which is x, over the hypotenuse, which is r. Oh, right, so it's cosine of sec times 
Yeah. So you are the other one is. just reciprocated, right? So x is r cosine of psi. And for the exact same reason, y is r of psi. Y r sine of psi. So that's those are our points. So r cosine of psi, r sine of psi. So it's very easy to go left to right. If you know r and psi, well, you just compute cosine of psi and multiply by r. Compute sine of psi and multiply by r. Done. What if you want to go back? Let's say you just have a number here. How would you figure out what r and psi are? When I say a number, I mean a pair. It's not broken up. You don't say, oh, this is r times block. You just, you just have a number here and a number here. How do you go backwards? Well, r is the distance, so you do the Pythagorean and give them how much number is to get r. Yeah. Okay. If you know the coordinate of this point, x comma y, you can compute the distance to zero by using Pythagorean theorem or the distance formula, however you like. Okay. So it would just be the square root of Right, well, let's draw a picture. Okay, if you have a point out here in nowhere, you have r psi. Well, I've actually, we, we want to know r psi, right? So we're actually given x, y. We want r psi. So this is a rectangular. Okay. Then we know that the r. We know that the r is just, well, let's see, that's x and that's y. So what, what's this over here going to be? The square root of x squared plus y squared. Yeah. So, okay, so square root x squared plus y squared. Okay, so that's the r. Cool. We can get one of them. Okay, now we need to get the psi out. Well, let's see, if we divide by this number on each of these, then we know what, I mean, we can get cosine of psi is x over the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? Mm -hmm. And the sine of psi should be y over the square root of x squared plus y squared. Tangent. Uh, ta okay, what is tangent? Tangent, what do, you, what do you want to say? You want to say tangent of psi is, well, let's see, uh, here's your sign. It's y over x, right? Opposite over adjacent. This is y over x. So you have three different ways of writing this down. The question is, from any one of these ways, can you figure out what psi is? What would you do, Ben? You can take the inverse. Take the inverse. Right? It's like you did arctan, tan of psi. So you might do arctan, right? So you said, okay, fine. So uh, y... Oops, psi equals arctan of y over x. Does this for sure give me the correct psi? No. Why not? Because it's only from 0 to pi over 2. Close with the, the, you know, the right idea, right? Minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, but that's still the, right. the problem, right? This arc tangent is only giving you angles over here, okay? Or depending, I mean, you can choose a different, uh, uh, a different, you know, domain and range for your tangent to have an inverse. The problem is, right? There are different angles that would give you this same angle here. I hope the coordinates to begin with would tell you what. Um. Well, let's say I took the angle psi plus two pi. I mean, it's all in radians. What, what, it gives me the exact same thing, right? Because 
if you want to go in radians, 2 pi takes me right back where I started. So I go 2 pi plus psi. It's the exact same place. No? If I did psi plus 4 pi, go around twice. Again, I'd get the exact same place. The moral is that a polar coordinate does not that uniquely determines a rectangular coordinate. Right? If you have the P, that determines the R. But knowing the R does not uniquely determine the P. It only determines it up to right, a 2 pi. Right? So that's just one of the, the natures of the beast. So this is, this is only, uh, this is not quite right. This is This is only one possible side. Come. So you could do plus two and pi. Yeah, exactly. Any multiple of pi, any multiple of two pi will work. Okay. And it may be even worse than that, depending on what number. It may be multiples of pi, depending on. Uh, I mean, if it's a zero, then there's mm -hmm. there can be a lot of different solutions. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this issue. All right, so now I need to do something to set up uh, what I want to call the polar form of a complex number. Uh, I need to set the stage a little bit by reminding you about something from calculus. So in calculus, you learned about Taylor series. And a Taylor series was a way of taking a function and using repeated applications of the derivative, writing down an infinite polynomial-like expression for that function. So for instance, you were able to write down, anybody remember what e to the x is? As a, as a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series, really? Starts with one plus x. Uh, you remember this? <laughs> x is the x one, one third x cubed. Uh, there's one before that. Uh -huh. yeah, x squared over two, and x cubed over six, or like three factorial. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. X to the fourth, of four factorial, and so on. gives you a really nice way to approximate e to the x for small values of x. You know, somebody says, uh, what's e to the point 1, 2? And you just say, well, let's see, if I forget these terms, already I get an approximation of 1.12. And that's very close. Which is, that's not too bad. OK. Um, you can also do this for sine of x. You know, when you do it for sine of x, a little funnier. I start with x, and then you get a minus sign, and you skip terms. And you seem to only get these odd, odd terms out. These odd degree terms. And then if you did cosine of x, you got well, the terms you were missing when you did the sine expansion. Now, if you added sine to cosine, you would have all the terms as you had in e to the x. And it would be almost the same, except for one little difference. The signs. Difference. The signs, right? You get, up here, everything is positive. Here, you get a couple negatives. But up to that, and, and really, what's a sign amongst friends, right? <laughs> uh, up to these little negative, what's the difference? They're almost the same, so this already suggests that sine and cosine are intimately related with e to the x. OK. So we play a little game. 
Um, more like charades. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do. Okay. Uh, when we wrote down a plus i, a plus bi times a minus bi equals a squared plus b squared. Remember we said there's something wrong here. This, this should be a minus sign. But somehow this, this i squared, right, turned it into a plus sign. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that this i can turn minuses that we don't want into pluses that we do and vice versa. Maybe a minus that we want into a plus that we don't. We're going to use that to get rid of all these minus signs. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to define e to the ix. Okay, so here, this is the imaginary number i. Okay, you have to define it. And we're just going to define it to be what would happen if you plug ix into this formula. Okay, so this is a definition. I'm not, I don't mean to prove it. I'm defining it. So this is going to be defined as 1 plus ix plus ix squared plus ix cubed. Oops, I'm missing. define a function which I'll call sine. And if I want to define it on sine of ix, then, well, I'll just define it as this, where I replace all my x's with ix. And what do you suppose I'm going to do with my cosine? Just toss an i. Find it. One minus i x two i four four minus Tell you right now, I'm sweeping some things under the rug. Technicalities. Don't worry so much. Think of it as watching a time travel movie, where if you really took the time travel seriously, it couldn't possibly make sense, and that you still watch it and enjoy it. Like that. Okay, so, well, over here there's really nothing to do, but down here, when you start, uh, you start squaring things, nice, nice things can happen. Uh, right? And, yeah. Let's see what happens if we start trying to put these things together. Maybe okay, I need more room. Okay, so let's see here. Um, this first one, so e to the ix is 1 plus ix. Well, I can't do anything with that. But what about this ix squared? Negative x squared. Yeah, right? This, this i becomes an i squared, and that's a minus 1. So it just is going to make that sign into a minus. Minus x squared over 2 the factorial. The i actually goes away completely. Uh, and the next one, let me see. What is i cubed? Negative i. Right? Yeah, because i squared is minus 1, so one more i just makes it negative i. So this becomes a negative uh, x cubed over 3 factorial, and then you have an i. Okay. 
we're going to put the I. Now put it first, or second over here too. Okay. Now what would be the next one? The next one would be one. I x to the fourth over four factorial, right? And Kaiway says one, right? I to the fourth. Well, it's I squared times I squared. I squared is minus one. Minus one times minus one is one. Boom. I to the fourth is one. So this just becomes x to the fourth over four factorial. Nothing changes. And then you might start noticing a pattern here, right? Notice no i has an i, no i has an i, no i has an i, right? All the even power terms are going to lose the i because they get a square in them that kills the, the i. Okay, and then what's happening to the sign? Positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, it's positive, right? Next one becomes positive, it's going to have an x to the fifth, and this one didn't have an i, so that one better have an i. So then this goes negative, negative, positive, positive. So let's do this with sine. So sine, we get uh, xi. Hey, that matches. That's good. Uh, and then let's we'll see the next one. Well, let's see. Positive x cubed. I. Positive x cubed, right? So if i cubed is negative i, and then you have another negative, so it becomes positive. Oh dear. That's not good. Where did we make a mistake? Somewhere. Okay, so what did we say? It was going to be positive x cubed, x cubed i. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no mistake. The i over here. Okay, next one. And you have i to the fifth. Now, there's a trick here. Instead of having to compute all these powers of i, once you get to i to the fourth, what did we get to? This one's just one. Yeah, right. I to the I to the fourth is already one, so I to the fifth. That's just I to the fourth, which is one times I. So it's just so I. Divided by four, the remainder is the power. Ah, very good, right? If you just take this, whatever you're raising I to, get rid of all the fours from it, right? And just see what the remainder is. So five divided by four. I don't care whether it's one. I just care that it's remainder one. So I to the fifth is the same as I to the first. If you had I to the ninety seventh. Still i to the first, right? Because 97 divided by 4 has a remainder 1. Okay. I always know that 96 was an Olympic year, and they do Olympic years and years divisible by 4. <laughs> Take it with you. Yeah. Okay, so no, i to the winter fifth. Winter Olympics. The, those used to be in off years, but now they're the same as uh, same as summer Olympics. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they're all running the same years now. So you don't have to worry about it. Much Alright, so that's just an i, and then you have x to the fifth. So plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial i. Let's do one more. Let's see, so the next one would be minus i x to the seventh over 7 factorial. So get i to the seventh. Well, we don't worry about seven, we just care about three, right? That's the remainder when you divide by 4. So i cubed was um, minus i, right? Because i squared is minus 1. And one more i, so minus i. So you get a minus i, but then you also have another minus. So this is still plus. And it's x to the 7th, 7 factorial. i? i. You. Uh, just make sure I'm getting all my. The one place you don't want to make a mistake in terms of arithmetic is here. Uh, I wrote these down so that I could I could check if I was making a good arithmetic error. Okay. So if I have, we'll just fix it. Okay. Okay. And so this is going to keep going. Uh, okay. What about cosine? So let's see, we have a 1, fine. Plus x squared over 2. Right, because i squared is minus 1, there's another minus, so it's plus. Plus. Well, can I generalize it? All the i's disappear and it's all plus. Addition. Yeah, let's see what happens there. So 
the i's to the fourth, those die, right? Those all go to ones. I's to the sixth, i's to the tenth, those all become minus ones. But those are all going to come when it's all minus. Right? When the i goes away completely, it's when you have a plus. When the i doesn't go away completely, it's when you have a minus. So it just stays the same. Uh, but it always goes away. That's it. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, now I see where we're making our mistake. So, um, you know, is that right? Let's write down the next line. So let me tell you what the answer should be. Okay, and then we'll we'll backtrack to make sure we, we put things right. E to the ix should be cosine of x plus i sine of x. And that's what it should be. So uh, we have a problem. Oh, the, uh, is, now I know why it's not going wrong. We didn't actually need to compute these. We need to just compute them without the x's. Yeah. So that's okay, because we already did that. So we just have to multiply. Uh... <laughs> it was fun to do anyways. Yeah, it was kind of fun. I think I made the same mistake last year when I tried to do this in 165. I always forget that you don't need to do this. So this is, uh, you can omit this. It's true, but you can omit this. Fun, but unnecessary. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's actually see if this is right. Okay, we just have to check. So e to the ix, I claim is cosine of x plus i sine of x. All right, so let's check. So the odd terms, or the even terms rather, right, the 1, the x squared, the x to the fourth, the x to the sixth, those should match up with the cosine, right, because the cosine is the one with the even terms. Okay, so let's check. So 1, negative x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth, let's see, 1, negative x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth. Okay. See how it alternates the right way. Cool? Okay, now what about the sign? Well, pretend this i wasn't there. If this i wasn't there, then you would have, uh, well, it just wouldn't be right. <laughs> it would, the x wouldn't match up with the xi, right? And the x cubed over 3 factorial, which is negative, that matches, but there wouldn't be an i. Okay, so that's why you need to have this I here, because otherwise it doesn't match up. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so, so it, it's, it's clear just by comparing this formula with these two formulas. <coughs> so, so you get this nice identity. Okay, now let me make one cosmetic change to this formula. <coughs> it's not a real change. Oh, this is pretty? It's just a cosmetic change. Oh. Uh, uh, as Ben learned today, this is a mouthful, cosine theta plus i sine theta. And so very often there is a shorthand that we say We call this cis theta for cosine, pi sine theta. Just a shorthand. Okay. Now, if I want to do an entire complex number, so it might look like uh, a plus bi. Well, this may require a proof, but we won't give it. Uh, rely on your intuition that this should break up is e to the a times e to the bi. And so you can then write this as e to the a times cis b. Cosine of b plus i sine of b. Because okay, you can just plug into that formula. So this tells us e to the z. All right. 
Now let's draw a picture in the complex plane. If you look at this way of writing down e to the z, and I get this e to the a, but a was a real number. This is e to the a. This is a real number right here. Okay. The only imaginary thing is the cis b. Okay. Well, if we draw uh, well, let's go back to our theta. So this is some number, right? It represents, it's a radian measure, but it, I mean, it's a number, but it can represent a radian measure. Draw the angle theta. And now I ask you, where is e to the i theta in the complex plane? Right? Well, it's the same place as cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay, so let's look at the rectangular coordinate. The rectangular coordinate looks like cosine theta, sine theta. Okay. This is actually, I mean, this is the, this is really, this is just a quote mark. This equals cosine theta plus i sine theta in the complex plane. So actually, and where do we know that this cosine theta sine theta lives in, well, if you're in R2, you know this lives on the that, that circle that, that has a unit length radius called the unit circle. unit circle, right? So this has to live on the unit circle in the complex plane. What that means is that if you have something of the form e to the i theta, which always looks like cosine theta, i sine theta, that is a point on the unit circle. So e to the i theta is always point on the unit circle. By the way, has a complex equation magnitude of z equal to one. That's a much easier looking formula than x squared plus y squared equals one. But it means the same thing. Now, if you have complex number z, we said you can break it up as e to the a times e to the bi. Now this e to the bi, that's on the unit circle. This e to the a, well this is just some number you multiply by it. So what does that do? Well it just moves you along this ray starting at the origin. Okay. Goes out here. That controls how far away you're going to go. So the e to the bi part, that controls your angle. And the e to the a part, that controls your distance. Okay. Now, if you know an angle and a distance, you have a polar form. Right. You write down a polar coordinate. So that's, that's sort of the idea behind what, what we're doing. So uh, you can write your z. Okay. If you have any point in the complex plane, z, you can decide, OK, what's its Put a z over here. Why don't we seem to do things in the first quadrant? Let's do it over here. Okay, there's my z. The first thing I can do is I can compute the distance from the origin, right? That's my r. And then I can compute this angle. Maybe you were using a sign. 
And so then the coordinate of this point in polar coordinates is just going to be r comma psi, right? Well, we can write it down here in this form. It's r e to the i psi. Because the this is actually a complex number here. Right? If we drew the uh, yeah, here's our unit circle. So this would be e to the i psi, and this is r e to the i psi. Okay, this r is the whole the whole line, not just this, but that's one. Okay, so there's your unit vector. That's the one with length one. It has the same angle, and then there's z all the way up there. You have to multiply it by r. This is this is the polar form of C. So problems that you might have to do on the homework involve, for instance, translating between the normal A plus B I form of a complex number and the polar form of a complex number. And you'll have to use a little bit of trigonometry to do this, right? Uh, Note, however, that you're going to run into exactly the same problem as we had earlier. Namely, there is not a unique size up here. Okay? If I take the angle that goes around once and then goes up psi, so 2 pi plus psi, I get another version. So z, in this case, also equals r e to the i psi plus which incidentally I can write as R e to the i psi times e to the 2 pi i. So you can, you, can, you have these different representations for how to do it, right? I mean, this, and this is just, well, what is this? You know they have to give you the same point. What is e to the 2 pi i? Well, it's cis 2 pi i, right? It's cosine, I mean, not cis 2 pi i, it's cis 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi plus i sine of 2 pi. What is cosine of 2 pi? Same one, right? It's 2 pi is the angle over here, right? It's 0, right? And the cosine over there is 1. What about sine of 2 pi? 0. zero. So this goes away. This is 1. It says e to the 2 pi i is 1. While we're at it, let's uh, say um, just e to the uh, pi i. See. Well, you have to do the same formula, right? But with pi instead of 2 pi. So cosine of pi, let's see, pi is over here. So cosine is negative 1. And the sine is still 0. So this whole thing is just negative 1. Or if you like, add the 1 to the other side, you get e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. And this is what is known as Euler's formula. one of the, I mean, it's considered one of the most beautiful formulas in math because you've connected maybe the five most important constants in mathematics, e, pi, i, 1, and 0, in as short of an expression as you could possibly imagine, right? You couldn't make this any better. And it doesn't squeak. And it doesn't squeak unless squeezed. Well, because it's boilers, right? <laughs> oh, not O I L. <laughs> yeah, oh, by the way, on, you liked it. I think I mentioned on the first day this name. Did I? No, no, I did Koshi and Riemann. That's right. This is another name I should have mentioned. Is one that you should know how to pronounce as a math major. Uh, the most common mispronunciation is what? Euler. Euler, right? That's what it looks like, but it's not pronounced Euler. Yeah, Koshi, Riemann, and Euler but not of the Houston Oilers. 
Sorry, you, that's before your time, isn't it? You know, there's a football team. They played the Monday night last week called the Tennessee Titans. Before they were the Tennessee Titans, they were the Houston Oilers. So, there was a good joke about that in Castaway. Oh, really? Yeah, when he came back, then he found out that Houston had moved to Tennessee. Yeah. Alright, so, so you start seeing some strange things are happening. You know, it's, um, it's kind of kooky little formulas are popping out. Ways of, I mean, we're connecting the exponential function, right? Looks like that. Sine function. Looks like that. Cosine just looks like that. Why should they be connected? And yet, all of a sudden, here's this really weird way of, of connecting them. Uh, now, if we. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Let's, uh, let's examine this unit circle a little bit more. Also, if this is a good time for somebody to ask a question if they have one. Did you really not like my joke? No, I just didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright, so uh, we have this important formula, which I'll just immediately write down again. Because I want you to know, alright, e to the i theta, right? cosine theta plus i sine theta. You've got to know this formula. Right? This is not one that you can just guess at. Okay? You've got to know this formula. You can forget Euler's formula, because you can figure it out if you know that. And you got to know, right? This is a complex number, so it has a norm. Right? And what was the norm? Where do these points lie? The unit circle. On the unit circle, right? They're in the cosine plus i sine theta. Right? It tells you this is sine one. Right. Now, let's say that uh, I have a point on the unit circle. Well, if I have a point on the unit circle somewhere, it has to be an angle that it makes with the x-axis. As soon as I know that angle, I can immediately write it down in this form. Which means that the unit circle, well, it's, it's a set of all complex numbers that have norm 1. But another way I could write it is it's the set of all complex numbers of the form e to the i theta, where theta goes from, if you like, uh, say, between 0 and 2 pi. Or just let theta be any angle. And then you'll get repetitions as you go around. Okay, so this is this is already quite nice. We can we can write the circle in this way. So the, the, the complex circle looks like e to the i theta. It's already kind of cool. Uh, all right. So in particular, well, let's say I start with a nice simple problem. Let's assume I have a complex number such that when I raise it to the fourth power, I get one. Now, we're going to see this more generally, so let me tell you, whenever you have a number, a complex number, and you raise it to a power, and you get one, you call it a root of unity. Okay, unity just means one, right? And root, well, it's like a, it's not, it doesn't mean, a, it means it's a root of this equation. Okay. So here is z is a root unity. In fact, we might say a fourth root of unity, because it's fourth power. Now, if I take the norm of z to the fourth, this should be the same thing as the norm of one. Because yeah, these two things are equal, right? So if you take the norm, it 
should stay equal. Okay. Now, what's the norm of one? Sure, one. Okay. It's just the square root of one squared. One. And what about this? Well, on your homework, I tell you if this is not a four but an n for any positive integer, I say compute this, and the, the answer should be the same thing as if you first took the norm and then raised it to the fourth power. Okay, so the exponentiation and the norm map compute. Okay, so now this tells me that I take this complex number, take its norm, which gives me a, a real number, and then I raise it to the fourth power, and I get one. Now, it's not only a real number, it's actually a positive real number. Right? The norm is always positive. So what possible number could this be? One. one. Could it be minus one? Or not? It's a norm, it's got to be positive. Tells me the normality is one. So this tells me that the root of unity lives on a unit circle, right? It has normal one. So if you take, and this is not, there's, and of course you'll notice we did nothing with four here, right? If I wrote an n everywhere. Where here n is, okay, so n is a positive number, so it's an integer, say, greater than zero. Put an n everywhere, nothing changes. It's the exact same proof. So nth roots of unity always live on the unit circle. nth roots of unity live. circle now, right? We're hunting them down. Uh, where do they actually live? Well, let's see if we can't actually come up with it. If z is a, an nth root of unity, that means that, well, if you raise it to the nth power, you get 1. Fine. But we also know that z has a polar form, right? The polar form of z looks like, well, it should look like r e to the i theta. But, well, actually, what's r if z is a root of unity? One. One, right? Because it lives on the unit circle. And r tells you, right, the, the, the radius of the circle you live on. Okay, so we actually, we know that z is just e to the i theta. So if we get 1 equals z, say, to the n, well, this is the same as e to the i theta to the n which is e to the i theta n, right? Okay. Fine, so I take some e and I realize that if I take the angle theta n, okay, and I multiply by i and I do e to the i theta n, that I should actually get back 1, okay? Which means that I've ended up back at this point right here. Right? This is 1 in the complex plane. And there's a way to write down 1, for instance, uh, e to the 2 pi i. Okay, so then I might say, ah, oh, fine. e to the 2 pi i, let me put the i's on the end, equals e to the uh, theta m i. So then you might say, uh, okay, well, we have a good sense that an E looks like this in the real world. Right? So uh, it should be injective, right? one to one. Uh, 
right? And if you go around the circle just once, so uh, that seems maybe reasonable. Okay, so then that would mean that these top bits have to be equal. So you say, okay, fine. And of course, the i's don't matter. You say, fine, that means that 2 pi is theta times n. So then if you divide by n, you recover what theta is. So theta is 2 pi over n. So let's, uh, let's draw a picture. Let's see if this is the whole answer. Let's see. Uh, let's let's go back to n equals four. So if n equals four. then we would get theta equals 2 pi over 4, which is 4 pi over 2. So this would say that the root is, right, when the theta is pi over 2. So pi over 2 is up here. So draw, draw our unit circle. So theta pi over 2 means this point right here. Now what point is that in the complex plane? R, here's your IR. What point is this? This is a unit circle. Mm. Zero. BI. It's, what is it? I. I. Okay. You've got one unit on the I axis. Okay. So it's I. Okay, so now let's see, does that make sense? Remember, we're, we're looking for roots of unity, so when n equals 4, then we'd be saying, okay, so this corresponds to okay, e to the I pi over 2. We just said that's equal to I, which we could also figure out using this formula. Right. Is it true that i to the fourth is 1? Oh, well, yeah, we did that earlier, right? We said you get rid of all the fourths. Okay, fine. Is that the only root? Is it the only way to take something, raise it to the fourth power, and get 1? No, it could be 1, right? 1 to the fourth power is 1. Negative one, negative one to the fourth power, right? That's one. Negative I. Could be negative i, right? Because well, at negative when you raise to the fourth power, it doesn't matter. So let's see. We got this point, but we missed this one over here. That's one. We missed this one over here. That's negative one, and we missed this one down here. That's minus i. Hmm. Okay. So how can we get these other three? Well. What would happen if we uh, started adding little bits to this? Right? Like we saw, well, okay, if we added here, here you get a root, but if you add pi over 2, you get another one. If you add another pi over 2, you get one. If you add another pi over 2, you get a root. So let's see. <laughs> What did we have to add? We had to add pi over 2. Well, pi over 2 came from 2 pi over 4. So we added 2 pi over 4. So if we added another one of these, then we should get another root. And if we added another one of these, we should get another root. Hmm. Let's see if that works. Okay, so let's erase those and write it down. Right. So what I claim is that uh, well, if z equals e to the i theta satisfies z to the n equals one, right? So it's a root of an nth root of unity. Then uh, z is an element of this set. It looks like E, uh, well, I don't even need to write all this. Theta looks like 2 pi q 
over n. Okay, what's this k going to be? Well, remember I said I would start with one of these 2 pi over n's, but then add another one, and I'd give you another root. So, and if I add another 2 pi over n, I'd get another root. So here's just all the different times I do it. I do it once, twice, three times, and so forth. Okay, so I could either, well, I could do it zero times. If I did it zero times, I'd get back to this one. I can do it one time, which gives me the 2 pi over n that I, I know I get. I can do it two times, three times, all the way up through, well, how many times? We'll see. Here, that's k equals 1. Here's k equals 2, k equals 3. Now, if I did k equals 4, I'd get the same thing as if I did k equals 0. So I, can, I don't need the k equals 4. So I just stop at k equals 3 for when n is 4. So I just need to go up through n minus 1. Okay, there's n of them. But is this right? I mean, this is a claim that I made based on anecdotal evidence, right? I had one example where that works. Is it true? Well, let's see. What happens if you take e to the i 2 pi k over n and you raise it to the nth power? Well, the n's cancel and you get e to the 2 pi k i. I keep moving the i on you, but it's just a constant. What is 2 pi ki? Well, k here is just a, some multiple 1. Uh, so this just counts how many times you're going around the circle. Okay. So you're starting at 0, right? But you go around 1 time, 2 times, k times. But you always end up back here. And of course, that's 1 when you go there. So e to the 2 pi ki is still always just 1. Here, the vertical bar doesn't mean excluded, right? No, no, the, when it's a vertical bar, it always means such that. What you're thinking of is this diagonal bar, something like this. That means exclude the number zero. Yeah. Okay. I guess we have to wrap up. So, uh, so what we have done here is we have found for any n, all possible nth roots of unity. And there are exactly n of them. What's more is you can, well, let's see, let's say we connected the dots. Yeah, square. If you had five of them, they actually, they all, I mean, notice the difference here. You, the way you go around the circle is just by adding 2 pi over n, whatever that is. So you're adding the same angle all the around. So you're going to get a diagram for, say, 5 that will look like a regular pentagon. For 6, you get a hexagon. This is going to be the beginning of the solution to the problem. Can you, for instance, trisect an angle, double a cube? These are these ancient Greek construction problems that maybe you've heard of at some point. Uh, in any case, this is, this is a nice way to remember things. It's also good, you see there's a lot of symmetry in these figures. So if you want to add up roots of unity, very often it's very easy to do so by just looking at this picture and saying, oh, well, if I add up all the roots, what do I get? Well, let's see. These cancel each other, and these cancel, and that's zero. That's quite nice.